Hey Doris, well I'm a few pages in. This book is going to be a quick breezy read, isn't it? And uh, I don't uh, yet quite know what I think of it. The writing is pretty good, I think. The story's interesting, although I realize I'm not really a, a big reader of kind of novels about a man against the elements without a whole bunch of characters, so I'm glad that we're also going to be reading about the, the daughter and the sister he left behind, because I think I'm going to find his exploration story, to be honest, uh, not so interesting, kind of Robinson Crusoe-y. Anyway, I am reading for how Native Americans or Indigenous the indigenous people are represented, and so far I'm not impressed. How are you feeling about that? I find there's a lot of stereotypes and uh, not much dimension to the, there isn't even a scene. I was very disappointed with the first contact that he had. It's just skimmed off in two or three sentences. Can't see them, can't visualize them. It's not, it's just, oh, I traded the, he traded this with the Indians and end of story. Well, I hope we get some more than that. Anyway, look forward to hearing how you're making out. Hey, Sean, <laughs> I was going to take you for a little walk while I was chatting about this book. Um, I live in a rural neighborhood and I think we might have some donkey sightings, but this book has given me all the thoughts in just the first 36 pages. So, I don't think I'm as good at walking and talking and thinking the way you are. So, we're going to have a sit down at the messy desk version and then I'll take you for a little walk and see if we can have some donkey sightings. Uh, yeah, so West, total cover buy for me. I love this cover. Um, sentimentally, I live just south of Kentucky where some of the book is set and I was completely entranced with the thought of going out into the wild unknown. That is the side of the story that appeals to me. That's why I bought it. Um, so I think we're nicely paired here. Um, one side of the story and the other so we should get some good thoughts on both between the two of us. Uh, yeah, I see what you mean about the um, Native Americans. They definitely were portrayed in a very stereotypical way at the onset of this book called Savages and um, being drawn to trinkets and such. Um, definitely not good. But, I think um, that there's a point in that. This being just such a tiny little book, 150 pages, she can't waste any time talking about inconsequentials. So I think there's a point to this discussion about the Native Americans. Um, and especially, I don't know if you, and I'm, I apologize in advance, this is going to be long, but I'll try to keep it short afterward. This book is just packed. Um, but here on the flap, I don't know if you got that since you're reading it digitally, it says, West is a spellbinding and timeless epic in miniature, an eerie parable of the American frontier, and an electric monument to possibility. Oh, wow. I just, I'm caught up in that idea of this being a parable, a parable to the West. Um, and I'm wondering what you think about that. There's just with this idea of a tiny novella, 150 pages, being an epic parable to the West and told in two storylines. There's the father, um, exploring the West and the daughter left at home that we have to get through in just 150 pages. So yeah, what do you think about that concept? It, it reminds me of um, Steinbeck novellas that are just so carefully constructed, beautifully written in every word. Her, her writing style is very 
minimalist but beautiful at the same time I'm really loving it so here's my thought to you I, I would love this book is giving me so many thoughts and I would love to talk about what this parable what are the the highlights of the parable what do they mean so the three that I've come across so far are the ridiculous stovepipe hat what does that mean uh, this is a guy who's obviously making his living in the country and he decides to take this epic journey out west and he goes and buys a gentleman's stovepipe hat to wear on his expedition they do allude to the fact that he thinks it'll make him look grander in front of the savages. I think there's an interesting point to be had with this. Um, the trinkets, they're brought up time and time again. Um, the trinkets that he's going to exchange with the Indians and the fact that they're called trinkets, which is a, a trivial kind of word. Uh, that lessens the impact of what he's actually trading for things that he desperately needs on the journey and then this Indian that you meet is a Shawnee brave 17 years old um, and his name <laughs> I forget his name but it's it's very interesting so let's talk about that you, you tell us what his name is and let's talk about that but I think that when we've just gotten to this Shawnee Braves perspective and we, we hear his voice and I think that's where the turning point in narrative is going to come with the Native American storyline. Um, so yeah, let's talk about these trinkets and it was so profound to me that some of his trinkets are his dead wife's things her knitting needles and her um, even some of her beautiful clothing he's taking to trade and his daughter is left at home without her father and her father is trading the, the things that she has left things that she would use in her life I don't know there's something there's something to unpack there and then the third thing is indeed this discussion of the Native Americans as savages and if that thought is going to change as the story progresses um, this larger than life imagery that the people have of the Native Americans because they don't know them and they only know this um, tense storyline with them and is he going to get a closer and more personal perspective the same thing with these bones that's the center of the story is these fossils that have been found and he still thinks that these great beasts are roaming the west um, and then the epicness of the west itself thousands and thousands of miles that he's covering just on horseback so that's the third the third um, bit of symbolism to unpack is the the monstrous scale of things with the large fossils and the Native Americans as wild savages in the West itself so let's talk about the parable here and where where um, Karis Davis is going with it because I think I'm hoping she might be brilliant let's talk about it hey Doris your last message gave me so much to think about and stimulated me so I've now read up to the 50% mark and have lots of comments but I want to keep it down to no more than um, your seven minutes and then we'll see where we're at uh, I was I've been paying really close attention to the language because as as we know Karis Davies is British is she Welsh I believe she's Welsh and I'm always a little bit uh, suspicious or it's, I'm a little, always a little bit cynical when a British writer writes a historical novel set in America such as Sebastian Barry's uh, much nominated novel last year the name of which escapes me and I'm finding that this book is fine um, she's kind of safeguarded herself by making her main characters the Bellmans is Bellman his first name his last name family name making the Bellmans uh, British immigrants to America so she can get away with 
as long as it's centered in their consciousness, this third person dips in and out of several characters. Uh, so Julie had heard about her brother's rootling in the library, which is, I didn't know, I had to look it up, but it's a very British English word for rooting, rooting around, rootling. But I wasn't as convinced by dog's body when the indigenous boy were in his consciousness and he thinks of himself as a dog's body and that's a very British English term. Again, I didn't know the word until I encountered it in the text. I can't wait to, for your donkey sightings because that is, I, I think you are intentionally planning to do that because of the story, right? So I think that the donkeys and the mules and all that has a pretty heavy symbolic significance and I'm looking forward to you explaining it all to me. Just an update, I'm totally fine with the Odyssey one man struggling against the elements story that we are reading because it's not just one man. As long as there's other characters in the story, I'm fine. So I'm fine. I'm really enjoying it actually. And also very relieved to say that the qualms I had at the very beginning with how the Native Americans were being represented, represented that's gone. Um, now that we've got an actual character, his name is old woman from a distance so yeah I want to muse on that as I read the second half of the novel I was absolutely fascinated by the genre issues that you introduced to this conversation Doris I will say that I don't see this as a parable and I don't like parables and parables to me are like from the Bible uh, they're didactic stories which I hate and I don't I hope this isn't a parable. So I think the, the the person who wrote that for the back jack the back cover copy needs to go back to university because no. Uh, but I'm also willing for you to educate me on why you think it's parable and I, you know, teach me. But no, I don't like that part of it. But epic and miniature, that's fascinating. So I've been having a great time kind of boning up on what is an epic and what is a miniature epic. I'd never heard of it. And it, it caught me back. It got me back into Northrop Frye, who was the preeminent literary theorist, literary critic of the mid 20th century, a University of Toronto professor. And his Anatomy of Criticism was the standard work of literary theory before all the post-structuralist deconstructionists ruined everything. Not that I subscribe to his theories. I don't know much about them, but he talks in that book, Google showed me, about miniature epics and had a lot of interesting things to say. He was mostly talking about poetry, but anything that you say literarily about poetry in terms of genre, like epic or whatever, can also be extended to, to uh, prose. So I might have more to say on that uh, by the end, but that was fascinating. So you introduced three and I'm not, I haven't read Steinbock novellas except for whatever I studied in school with a pearl or something. So feel free to enlighten me more on that. But the three points that you raised um, just really fired my imagination too. So that ridiculous stovepipe hat. Yes, it was ridiculous. And I don't know where it's going to play. I do. I did read a review that gave me a little bit of a spoiler of how the stovepipe hat uh, it does show up as a plot in the plot a little later so we'll have to, lots to talk about there so I don't know what to make of it I mean other than what you said I mean it's kind of a grandiose wanting to impress the natives almost like wearing a trinket on his head and yes so that right in segueing right into number two the trinkets including his dead wife's things Fascinating and, you know, a symbol or an image of the, the the first contact between the settler culture, which is the term we now very recently have started using in Canada, the settler culture, the col colonialists, and the indigenous tribes, and how that trade developed and was a kind of a rape of the land and of the people that we displaced. And so again, segueing right into your third point, which was the Native Americans as savages and the monstrous scale of the land. So all of that, I think it is an epic in miniature. I don't really know how to talk about it more than what I've said, but I'm looking forward to you 
saying more about that as we read through the second half together. And I loved you finished your video by saying, I'm hoping she might be brilliant. And I, I think she is. I, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I think the writing is beautiful and I'm finding that all of the things I was worried about in the first few pages are gone. I'm just enjoying it and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you make of it and let's finish it up. I don't know if we're going to finish it today or not. It doesn't matter, but look forward to hearing from you. Man, that's some scary stuff. It's like Jurassic Park. It's not normally this violent. We've been getting a lot of rain lately. This one's so beautiful. This is a tiny one. choice of words let's go with allegory because I just really like a book that I can dig beneath the surface it gives me a thrill um, and with the novellas and Steinbeck just comes to mind because he wrote several and they're brilliant I also read um, I'm looking at them Ethan Frome and Daisy Miller this month and it's just with a novella it <laughs> you're gonna laugh but it reminds me of my recent um, tiny house addiction on YouTube. Just these carefully constructed tiny homes and every element has to serve a purpose and every element has to be visually appealing, aesthetically pleasing. And you know, a great novella is both those things. So yes, you see the connection there? I don't know. Um, but, Anyway, I had a couple of things that I wanted to talk about before we went past halfway. Um, I was wondering what you thought about, <clears throat> yeah, just that eye, the thought of that eye peering through the slats in the home was so incredibly disturbing to me. And then the next section you find out um, what happens to our Native American boy what happened to his sister horrific and I don't think you know looking at the the novella structure I, I think the placement of those two scenes back to back was for a specific purpose and for me, I thought, gosh, was I more disturbed by one than the other? I had to, I had to think about that and, and think, I think the author wanted me to think about that. 
Um, and if that's part of the purpose of the story, thinking about, you know, colonialization, Western settlement, um, what we as Americans did to the indigenous tribes. Um, I don't know. These are things I think about when I'm reading books like this. Uh, and the other thing is how this plays into our greater symbolism in the in the book about um, this m monsters the he's on this quest to find these um, large fossilized animals living living out in the West in his time and you know his sister thinks he's going to be set upon by all these savages and now I kind of wonder when we've gone through these scenes with these two young girls, if the author's trying to tell us that maybe these monsters aren't out in the world, um, out in the wild, but are actually in society, uh, are actually in each of us, maybe? I don't know. Something to think about as the book progresses um, about where the monsters actually are and this theme of the loss of innocence. Mm. So anyway, I'm really anxious to read the second half and wow, I think there's just going to be massive amounts of things to unpack in there and I am still on my own quest to find donkeys. My local donkeys aren't cooperating, so yeah, to be continued. <laughs> hey, Doris. Well, here I am at my local neighborhood station. It's windy, and I lost my uh, wind protector on my mic, so we'll see how this ends up sounding. And uh, not too much daylight left, but I thought I'd sit down and uh, wrap up the first half of this novel. I loved your last message. You gave me so much to chew on again. And yeah, allegory definitely works well for me. I'm gonna sit down here. Ugh, you can see lots of people on their way to Sasazuka Station, to and from the station. And hopefully you'll see some cute guys. Uh, my collar's blowing up. It's because I'm getting all hot under the collar, maybe. Anyway, um, uh, allegory is great. Yeah, that's that's uh, works for me. And I think not a naive allegory. You know, in the like the old time allegories where there's no real uh, dimensionality to the characters. These characters, I think, are quite, most of them, what do you think, are quite fully realized. But there is definitely a larger story that's being told. Epic in miniature. Uh, allegory. You can read it allegorically, certainly. So, yeah, the gender violence is certainly ominous by this point, And the juxtaposition that you pointed to was powerful and freak, freakish, it just freaked me out. It just made me on the, on the edge of my seat for the rest of the novel. So I finished it, but I'm not gonna talk past the first half, and we'll process the second half in part two of this video. The fact that he's on this quest f to find real life dinosaurs and traveling out into the frontier with the Shawnee boy, which always sounds funny to me because my name is Sean, and I sometimes used to be nicknamed Shawnee and even Shawnee Boy, so but the Shawnee Boy with the very weird gendered name, Old Woman from a Distance. What does that all mean? How does that all tie together? I think we're going to be able to tease more of this out as we move into the second half and start talking about the second half, but I think for certain readers it wouldn't work, but it really came together for me and I'm not I'm all, that comment extends to the second half, but you know, even the first half, I just you can't help but fall deep into it. So that was certainly my experience. That's all for now. Look forward to delving and diving deep into part two with you soon. Bye.